called in Christ alone.
Praise God. No other name worth glorifying, Jesus, but yours. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. May your glory be known in this place, Father. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you've done to this point in this conference. Father, we know it's Wednesday morning, and yet it feels like we have been feasting on the absolute best from your table. We've had so much this week already, and there's more to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. You know, it's one thing you can eat and eat and eat and not be a glutton. And that's whatever is served from the table of the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, don't forget, real quick, that today is the, uh, the day of the pizza party. Glory to God. And right after the service, we'll be going to Marion's. If you don't know how to get there, don't worry. Just follow the caravan. And uh, if, you wanna, if you haven't given any money to Kathy and you'd still like to, you can do that. Uh, but again, don't worry about the money. Just show up and fellowship with us and enjoy the lunch. Right now, you get to enjoy each other's fellowship and shake a few hands. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, exhort over the offering if you want to find your seat. Hallelujah. Somebody say glory. glory. Let's get the blood pumping. L.A.'s got it this morning. Somebody say glory. glory. <laughs> Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 course um, you know in, in, in this day and age in the church world and the way that uh, things have gone with money I, I count it a honor to have some of the uh, purest mentors in my life uh, you know we all know we all know Pastor Dave and we were <laughs> we were joking in the hotel room yesterday me and Gary someone brought up and said well you know you guys follow the Marvel Universe, right? The, if you, I don't know, it's, let's get a little carnal, right? You're, you're watching all the Marvel films, and, and it was Kevin, and he was like, you know, we all have our separate things going on. It's like the Marvel Universe, but we all get together during conference, and it's like the Avengers get together, right? <laughs> and I was like, well, Pastor Dave's got to be Captain America, because he's the first Avenger. I mean, he, he spearheaded it. He brought us all together, you know? 
And I, I am so thankful to have been a part of his ministry, and not only Pastor Dave, but Gary. You guys know Gary, right? Pastor Bronk, Pastor Jim, because we're, you know, me and Richard are kind of like the coming up next generation. We've had some very pure examples when it comes to money. And I am so grateful because it has saved me years already. Because I have watched the method of how they've handled money. That, and, 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 you know, Pastor Dave when the, and Gary, when they first started uh, going after the tithe, oh, my God, that was sacred territory, you know. And remember Pastor Dave saying, the devil's shaking everything in my cornfield, but these two corns, he's not going to take them, you know. <laughs> you guys remember that? You listen to Pastor Dave? Well, when they went there, you know, it was a monumental effect on the giving because people dropped back, Dave says, to where their heart really was when you remove the compulsion and the, the, the if you don't give, you're cursed. If you don't give, God's not going to bless you. And we all know at this point, that's a bunch, bunch of hogwash, right? Right? But watching these men, you know, I get the privilege of hanging out with Gary and listen, I have not met a more liberal person when it comes to money. He, and, you know, Brad, he's here, you know, don't, don't, don't talk, he's here, but I've seen it in action. It, it, he, he gives, he gives without question. Because, you know, part of God's nature is for God so loved the world that he, so listen, if you really are getting intimate with God and you're spending time with him, the fruit of your relationship with him is you're going to want to give. And if you're not giving, listen, I'm going to get a little bit. On the other side of this, if you're not giving, and it doesn't just have to be money, you could give in so many different areas, but if, if, if you're not giving, it's a sign that you're not that intimate with God, because you cannot get to know God without wanting to give, and I mean give without expecting anything back. You see, before we were born again, when we were yet in sin, listen, the heart of the gospel, when there was no hope left for us, God sent his son, and it was in hopes that we would actually accept him, but God knew that there was going to be a ton of people that would not accept him. So it wasn't a guarantee on our part that we were going to say yes to what he gave, but he gave anyway. And he, listen, he didn't expect, it wasn't like a, they're going to have to do this. It was up to us to accept what he did. And the heart of that is the whole message of giving, that it comes from a heart that loves God and that trusts God. Well, I found the more intimate that I get with God, if I'm really, really getting intimate with him in my time, my, my personal time, my heart, you can't, you can't stop me from giving. And even sometimes, you know, we say you've got to hear God. Listen, God's a giver by nature. Sometimes you don't hear, you just give because it's who he is in you. Hello? <laughs> But see, I, I'm thankful for these men. I, I keep up with Jim and Bronk and listen to the services, and I watch how they preach, how they conduct services. There's nothing wrong with uh, taking up an offering. It's healthy. Uh, it's scriptural, right? And there is, uh, when we went full-time in the ministry, I was so blessed to find out that there was actually people around the world. Listen, they didn't know that we went full-time in ministry, but they knew God. And God all of a sudden started talking to them, and they, through obedience to his voice, started to give to us. I didn't announce it when we went full time. It was mum's the word. Listen, I believe you do things by faith. So when God said, I want you to walk off your job, my heart said, if this is you, you're going to come through. I'm not going to tell a soul. I told, I told Gary and Tim and some of the elders in my life, just so we're all on the same page, because it's really important to seek after wisdom. I, I trust these voices in my life. But see, we, we went full time, and I didn't have a dime in the bank. Everybody say dime. I didn't save up for this. We were just about to have Mila. It was the week she was born, and God, we had been talking to me and my wife about it. We were both in agreement. Listen, I didn't just decide to quit my job. God led us there, and I was sure about it. Everybody say sure. So you can't just lead your own life in this either. You got to hear God. But see, if God tells you to do something, I promise you, if it's really him, he is going to come through. So I knew it. We walked off our job. You know, my, me and my wife were shaky. We didn't have a dime in the bank. We, it was the week my daughter was born, and my expenses in life just went up. And we went from having to not having, and there was zero dollars in the bank. I did not tell a soul. I was just really starting to preach at the prayer center, you know, and at that time I was kind of offending everyone, wasn't the most likable preacher. <laughs> oh, somebody say glory. <laughs> 
And all of a sudden, people, listen, people around the world that were intimate with God, they, they, they heard. And they started to send us money, and it blew me away. Because God, you know, he can provide from the ravens. Listen, he can, but he wants to use his body. Because using the body, there is an intimate relationship that the giver has with God just as much as the one that's receiving. And see, God wants to build trust in us in our giving, that he, he prompts you to give. And, oh, that, that hurts a little. I've been there. You just, man, I can't do that right. Listen, if God's telling you to do it, the best thing you can do is listen. Because he's building a trust, and you're building a trust with him. And in obedience, that's where growth happens the most. You have faith and you do and you do and you have faith. But if you say you have faith and you don't do, I say your faith is. You guys know the scripture? But the first step I believe in giving always is that you first give yourself to God in intimacy. Always. There's no compulsion. There's no strain. I mean, there's no. But man, if you ever really get intimate with God, your heart's going to want to give. You'll be sensitive to him as he speaks, and then you'll want to do it. I'm, I'm so grateful for all the people around the world that have given. And I know every ministry in here would attest to that, that they give. They give from this place of obedience and relationship. And we're not putting strain on them. We're not putting, but they're doing it from their hearts. And that is the most precious thing for the kingdom advancing. And all of us moving forward together. Amen? Amen. The more time you spend with God, the more you're going to want to give. If you're not already giving, I think your first step is to start to spend time with God. Because he'll change your heart and make you want to give. So whatever you would purpose, if the ushers would come up here, you don't have to give today. You know, there's no pressure. But if God, listen, we know two ways. If God speaks, you listen. If he doesn't speak and you want to give from what a man has, the abundance of your heart and what, what's in there that you'd like to do, give from that place. But never give because you're being, you know, prompted and you have to do this. You give from the place of purity and intimacy with God. Amen. Oh, and whatever he says, we will do. Say, whatever God says, I do. I trust him. He's my provider. And I'll look to him as my source. Oh, so, Chris, why don't you go ahead and bless the offering this morning? Amen, amen. Man, I never get to my scripture, I tell you. <laughs> Where do you Hallelujah. Right here? Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Nathan. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> What's happening right now? You don't want me dancing. These are my best moves. Be kind. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't really hear the song. What is it? Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I don't, what was that? <laughs> I love LA. When I was first a student in the United States back in 95, I would introduce myself to people. Hello, my name's Alain. And I'd get a, a blank look and a fear. I could see the fear in their eyes. Like, I don't know what you just said. <laughs> and uh, I'd say, well, don't, it's okay, it's okay, you can call me Al. And it became such a regular thing that I, it just, my name's Alain, you can call me Al. My name's Alain, but you can call me Al, and so on and so on. And then people started playing that song by Paul Simon, you can call me Al. Anyway, it's a good song. You can look it up on YouTube later. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Nathan. Nathan's great. Isn't he different? <laughs> can, you, can you say, one of these things just doesn't belong? Right? Sesame Street, one of these things just doesn't belong. I really appreciate him because we need different people. Yeah. And if we're all cut from the same cook cookie cutter, we need someone else to come in and kind of stir things up. Uh, I admire the way the Holy Spirit ministers through him. Um, like yesterday, please turn to Ephesians 3, and then we never, ever went to Ephesians 3 again. 
That was it. Um, I kind of feel that way this morning, the Holy Spirit kind of picking on me. I, I got up this morning, I was ready, and then it's like he took my notes and just moved them all about. And so we'll see where we end up. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, I've been preaching for about 20 years, and I still get a little bit nervous when I first get up here. My dad says, the day that goes away is the day you need to be concerned. <laughs> Some people say you should picture people naked. You pervert. I don't picture people naked. That's terrible. But anyways, hallelujah. What I do is I kind of get up here, kind of try to relax. I um, want to just tell you before we get into this, I mentioned it on Monday night. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you're looking for that, you can go to YouTube. At the very top, there's a search bar. And just type in uh, Jim Martin Ministries, Dayton OH. It'll bring you to our website, or our YouTube channel, rather. And uh, if you... Subscribe and click the little, little bell to be notified. Every time we upload a new video, you'll get a notification. Uh, on any device where you've signed in to YouTube, it'll let you know that we've uploaded something. Now, we're not the only ones with a YouTube channel. Used to be, the guys who have gone on before us would have to mail out all these cassette tapes. Some people don't even know what that is yet. Um, but uh, Gary Carpenter Ministries, if you go into YouTube, Put that in the search uh, bar, you'll find Brother Gary. Bronk Flint Ministries, put that in the search bar. Again, subscribe, click the bell. Great Commission Church. Now that one you're going to have to search around a bit for Richard's beautiful face because there are a whole lot of Great Commission Church, but again, it's there, okay? Uh, Nathan Varbel, he has one now. I just subscribed the other day. And of course, we have Lego Ministries, but you can find us on... Uh, Jim Martin Ministries all the time. There once was a day when we'd have to send out tapes or DVDs or CDs or whatever. It's all at our fingertips. Man, you're on a long road trip. As long as you have Wi-Fi, you could pipe it through your speakers wirelessly through Bluetooth, and Bob's your uncle, right? It's always there. Amen. Glory, yeah. Gloria? Sorry, I was starting to say glory. And then anyways, Gloria, would you move the camera over to this corner here? I'm going to introduce Jamie. Jamie, of course, would you please stand? She needs no introduction. <laughs> Woohoo! I am Jamie's husband. I belong to her. Uh, pro tip for the young guys coming up, it's always important to let the ladies know that you belong to someone. All right? Amen? I belong to Jamie. And you don't stand a chance. She's amazing. So don't even bother trying. Hallelujah. Oh, boy. Thank you, Jesus. Would you open your word or turn on your device and go to John chapter 15? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hello, everyone in Internet land. Thank you for joining us. I greet all the Canadians up there who are watching, in particular my parents. They are, parents are amazing. They're always encouraging. They're always in my corner. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. All right, be Nathan. Just follow the Spirit. John chapter 15, verse 1. Of course, we've been here a few times this week already. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. In every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. We understand this. We're, we're beginning to really uh, go beyond just a natural intellectual understanding, but really see how it's working in, in the spirit realm and how it's working in our individual personal lives. I, you know, for me, I would have identified certain things that I've gone through recently. I would have thought at one point that they were impasses, but I'm now recognizing and have been recognizing that they weren't so much impasses as they were purgings. It was the Lord removing things that I was relying on for my own security. The incredible thing about a dead limb is that we think it's a strength for us. We think it's something that we can hold on to, that it protects us, that it's part of our structure that helps us stand on a day-to-day -day basis, when in reality, a dead limb will only produce death. Um, 
I did not know this, but I looked it up because I'm not a horticulturist. But uh, one of the things that you're supposed to do on a regular basis, if you have a property with lots of trees and so forth, or any trees, is that you're supposed to go and regularly prune the tree, not just because you want to produce more flower or whatever, more, more fruit, but because if you don't remove that which is dead, sick, or dying, it actually eventually produces death in the rest of the tree. That dead limb is vulnerable to insects, fungus, disease, or whatever, and once it becomes vulnerable, if you don't cut it off, it actually works backwards back into the tree. The insects find their way into that dead branch. They work back. They kill the tree. And it's amazing because, you know, here is this thing that maybe we're holding on to because we think, I need this. I need this in my life. I need this limb. It, it's so important to me. Lord, don't take this away from me. It's, it's a sense of security, if you will. And the Lord is saying, no, but it's, it's going to kill you. It's producing death in your life. You have to get rid of it. I, let me do this. Let me do this in your life. And so really I can say that, you know, starting in the fall, the Lord was beginning to work on some things in my life and really coming into the new year, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, there came a point where I thought, wow, except you be with me, Jesus, there's no way I'm getting through this. This is horrible. Uh, you, Jamie would come and check on me in the office and be like, are you crying? I don't cry a whole lot, but I was weeping because of the purging that was going on because I, I thought, I can't let go of this. I need this. Why are you taking this away from me? And I can, rep I can happily report I'm on the other side of it. Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I just kept my eyes on him. I remember so many times saying, I don't know how to get to the other side of this except you. I know that if I just hold on to you and do the things that I've been taught to do, keep worshiping, keep praying in the spirit, keep fasting, keep pressing into the Word, just let the Word wash over me over and over again. Sometimes I couldn't even read. I just let, have it playing on my computer because I, what am I going to do? The emotion of the pruning was, ah, and hallelujah, he got me through it. Now, we know that in the natural and on the human body, if we get an infection in our extremities and it becomes infected to the point that it dies, there's like a necrosis or something like that. It produces gangrene. And sometimes the only solution that they have is to amputate, to cut it off. Because if they don't, that death works its way back and it kills the body. God has to do that pruning. We have to allow it. And sometimes when we lost a limb, they say that they have uh, sometimes phantom pains or phantom itches or whatever. Uh, you know, the limb is gone, but you want to itch your finger, and you can't because it's, it's gone. And it's interesting because even though God has purged this limb out of my life, and it's great. I mean, Jamie can attest to it. There's a marked difference in me. I see it. You know, when you know you can see the, the change in your own life, you know God has done something. And yet every once in a while, there's like a phantom itch. It's there, that, that old thing, that old thought pattern that I used to rely on to keep me safe in times of anxiety or stress or whatever, it wants to come back. No, I'm not taking you back on. It was hard to get rid of you in the first place. Hallelujah. I love the, uh, the illustration that Brother Gary shared with us last night. Pick up Gary. Some of what the Lord has been purging from me is, in fact, identity. Um, Brother Gary was here back in March, and he shared that analogy very briefly, almost like a, a side note. And when he was sharing, I was like, that was for me. God put that in your mouth for me because I knew some of what God was doing, but I didn't really understand some of the rest of it. And I realized that's what God is doing. He's changing my identity. And I had really determined this is who I am. Alain is Alain the, not the pickup guy, but Alain the whatever. I don't want to tell you. Um, it's none of your business. It's a nun, yeah, exactly. But I realized, oh, wow, he's changing my... And you know, it's hard to change identities because you thought that's who you were, and wait a minute, that's not who I am. But you know, it's so liberating to know I don't have to try to be that because really who I am, as Nathan so expertly explained to us yesterday, is the image that has been deposited in me. I don't have to try to be this to try to satisfy what I think you want from me. 
all I have to do is be who he has made me to be. Hallelujah. But I have to let him purge or cut off all these dead limbs because really all they're doing is producing death. Sometimes when God is purging a limb and it's gone, there's like a mourning that begins to happen. Because, and, and, and we begin to mourn that thing that he's taken away, yet we shouldn't be mourning. It was something that was going to kill us. It's like God was saying to me, stop mourning this thing, grow up, but at the same time realize this was death to you. I needed to remove it. Don't mourn it. It had to go. It wasn't a good thing. In Leviticus, I think I wrote it down, Leviticus 10. Do you remember Aaron had a couple sons, Nadab and Abihu, and they brought in strange fire before the Lord, and the Lord consumed them? You know, you read a little bit further on that Moses gives Aaron and his two other sons an instruction. Don't mourn their death. Don't even take your, your covering off your head. Don't you know, wear sackcloth. Don't appear to be mourning because what they were doing was wicked and they had to die. Don't even mourn the loss of that limb. It had to go. Look to what God is doing and say, wait a minute, thank you. I reject this dead limb. I don't want any part of it. I don't even want to celebrate the memory of it because it was never good for me. It was always death for me, even if I didn't know it for so long. Amen? Praise God. Don't mourn the thing that was killing you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're, I believe we're living in difficult times. I think we're, we're coming into a season where we're going to start experiencing an increasing measure of persecution. And I used to think when I was younger that the persecution would come from without, but in fact, I think the greater measure of persecution is going to come from within. Years ago, I, I remember saying something to the effect that the whole LGBTQ nonsense was really just a distraction, that it was you know, a shell game, that the enemy was trying to draw our attention towards that and, the, and the, you know, the chaos and the nonsense and the foolishness of it all while he was actually doing something over here. And I believe what he had been doing and has succeeded in doing is that he's been implanting a false doctrine in the hearts of so many of our brethren that the persecution is actually going to come from within. It's going to come from people that at one time or another we were very close to. And isn't that what Jesus said, right? That he was going to set a plumb line of truth and those who would accept it and walk in it, it would cause a division between them and mother and father and brother and sister and son and so forth. And that division is, is happening in the body of Christ today. And there's a, a strong division in that there are people who have bought into a deception, hook, line, and sinker to the degree that they are living as wickedly and as lasciviously as the world. They're unrecognizable except that they have, a, they have fig leaves, a whole bunch of fig leaves to make themselves look like they are walking with Christ, but they aren't. You know, um, there was a day not too long ago where pretty much across the board, except for some weirdo denominations, everyone would agree that sin was sin. That's right. If you stood behind a pulpit, and, and it didn't matter what de denomination you were, but you went into some other denomination, and you said that fornication was sin, they would agree with that. Across the board, everyone would agree that this is sin, and this is sin, and this is sin, and so on and so forth. But now we live in a day and age where so many of the denominations say, well, yeah, maybe it's sin, but it's not that big of a deal. You know, we're, we're, things that are almost inconceivable, that they would defend things like abortion. There are people in the body of Christ today who name the name of Jesus who would defend abortion, defend it's a woman's right. It's a woman's right. That there are denominations today where some woman could, could take something that was good and pure and holy. You know, there was a, a time where Young women were making vows unto God. I'm going to stay pure, and I'm not going to go and give my body away to everybody. Lord, I am marrying you, or I'm betrothed to you until such time as you bring my husband to me. And they would get a ring as a symbol of that vow and commitment they made unto God. And now we have people in the body of Christ who not only mock that, but take those rings 
telling women, you have power over your own body. Don't let some patriarchal male tell you what you can and can't do with your body. Give me those rings. They me- they got, she got thousands of these rings. She melted them down and made a statue of the female genitalia. And this is a woman who would profess to be a preacher of righteousness. This is the body of Christ. How, is, how can this be? Where did this come from, right? You know, not too long ago, in fact, it was about three years ago, Pastor Bronk brought out a series, I want to say it was spring of 2016, called the Bayonet Training. And it was a very, it's, I highly recommend it. You can find it on his YouTube channel, Bronk Flint Ministries. And, you know, I wrote down some things about it. Let me just go find that. Thank you, Jesus. This bayonet training uh, was a prophetic word. Prophetic word speaking to the state of the body at that time. We're we're talking about three years ago. And a prophetic word speaking and revealing some of the things that were to come. And, you know, some of the things that he prophesied that were to come, you know, as you're listening to it, as I was listening to it those years ago, I thought, well, you know, that's a ways off yet. That's a ways off yet. It's not a ways off anymore. A lot of it has, is, is here now. It's come to pass. And it's come to pass so much more quickly than I ever thought it would. And I think that's more evident. You know, uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, what's wrong with you guys? That you can't, you can understand the sky and, and the weather patterns and understand what kind of weather we're going to have tomorrow, but you can't look at the signs of the time and see what's going on. They're, the signs of the time are pointing to his return. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that, he s- that Pastor Bronx said in this series is, look, if, you know, no one should ever backslide, but if you thought, yeah, I'm just going to go play in the world for a little bit and come back, now's not the time to do it because you may not make it back in time. Yeah. It's, it, don't do it. And it, and it was a, a sobering warning to people who kind of have a foot on either side of the fence and kind of playing a little bit in the world and playing a little bit in the church and so on. Cut it out. The end is so near that you may not make it back in time. Don't do it, right? And it's, again, go ahead and listen to that. It's a very powerful series. I'm just going to read something to you that he read in that series. And it's just a few excerpts. He says, this is the present state of much of the church and the world, referring to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul prophesies of a time in which that man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. These words demonstrate how this could ever happen. Notice that it says that he will oppose and exalt himself against all that is called God. It doesn't just say that he will exalt himself above God. It says that he will come against all that is called God. The word called in the Greek is the word lego, to lay forth, to set in words, usually in systematic or set in a discourse. In other words, that which has been set in effect or the standard of God that has been set into effect by the standard of his word, so it might also be read or understood like this, this man will exalt himself above all the moral standards that are set by the truth of God's word. And isn't that what we're seeing in so much of the body of Christ today, the body at large, is that we see that the moral standards that God has established in his word, they're being redefined and they're being replaced. And to such a degree that some of us who haven't walked that path, we're looking at that wondering with our uh, redeemed minds, with our uncorrupted minds, wondering how could they ever think this? How could they... Where in their their logic can they come up with scriptures or support from the word of God that says it's okay to kill babies? How? Where? Where where does this come from? Well, it's coming because that's what the, the, the son of perdition does, right? Again, how could the man come to such a place of prominence that he could actually exalt himself above the truth of God's word and get away with it? The answer is plain and it is simple. It is mentioned in the very same verse. That day will not come unless there is a falling away first. 
A falling away in the Greek is apostia, a- apostasia, which means a defecting from the truth. And that's what we're seeing, isn't it? This is a prophecy concerning the church, not the world. This is a defecting from the truth. The world cannot defect from the truth and never was in Christ, but Christians can and Christians will defect from the truth. Satan is making his last great move to systematically remove the word of God. Somebody earlier this week said that they're trying to recreate or redefine Christianity apart from the word of God. It is exactly what is happening. In fact, so many times when you talk to people who lay claim to the name of Jesus, who declare themselves to be Christians, and they do things that you know to be wickedness and evil, when you ask them about it, they throw scriptures here and there and whatever that they don't really understand. They don't know the word of God. They think they do. They think they know it, but they don't. Satan is making a last great move to systematically remove the word of God out of the hearts of God's people. This was the first and great diabolical ploy in the Garden of Eden, has God said. Amazingly enough, he is removing the word without ever stealing a Bible. He is removing it without ever depleting the masses in the churches that are receiving this redefining. Conversely, there is a growth in the Christian circles that embrace this redefining. And this may be known as the age of the church that never left. Sorry, the age of the church that left but never went anywhere. Meaning the church committed doctrinal apostasy from the truth without ever leaving the pew or dropping their church attendance. And all this is meant to introduce Satan's champion in the earth, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. This is, this is, we're living right here, right now. It has increased in, um, in speed, if you will, at such an exponential rate. Again, if there, ever was, there was a time to not backslide, I dare say this is it. Because you may not make it back. Not too long ago, I have a Facebook account. I like to go to Facebook because I like to laugh, and people post things that make me laugh. Uh, I've purged a whole bunch of Facebook friends, people who at one time maybe I thought I knew or whatever, but a whole bunch of people who, sadly, most of them were Christians, and most of them were Christians, Facebook Christians, as we say, really both feet in the world but not knowing it. It started off early, you know, uh, people I graduated from Bible school with who would post inappropriate pictures of women and so forth, and I private message, hey, is this, you know, was your account hacked? What's going on? And no reply or, oh, yeah, it wasn't me or whatever. But then it keeps happening. It's like, forget it. You're gone. Um, But not too long ago, one of my Facebook friends is one of my former teachers in Bible college. And he had a post, and it was just a question. And basically the question was, I keep hearing about this show, this television show called Game of Thrones, And I keep hearing that Christians are watching it. Should Christians be watching this show? Now, of course, I know better than to engage in a Facebook debate. (laughs) However, uh, I went to the comment section to see what would Christians say. And to my dismay, the vast majority of them not only readily, happily admitted to being consumers of that show, but defended it. Defended it saying, God doesn't care. God doesn't care. The Christians who watch the show and the Christians who don't watch the show are going to the same heaven. What's wrong with you guys, you Pharisees? Now, for those of you who don't know the show, uh, my understanding from what I have read, even from secular, non-Christian people who would never watch the show, okay, that's... That should convict you as a Christian if people in the world are saying, I would never watch that filth, okay? So this show has uh, a flagrant nudity. It's pretty much continuous. Uh, While they uh, engage in fornication, we commonly used to call that pornography, okay? Used to be, that's pornography. Naked people doing it on a screen, there you go, okay? Let's not beat around the bush, right? Uh, there's just constant witchcraft. Um, what else is, is, is there? Like it's murder and all these other things. Okay. 
Incest, right, that's right, incest. One of the, the flagrant, wicked fornication is there's continuous incest, and there are children born of that incest who are depicted in the show. I mean, come on. Are you serious? So here, here you have these Christians defending it, and there's, there's a gap. You have all these older Christians saying, that show's filth, I would never watch that. No Christian who has a, uh, uh, an unseared conscience would ever watch that. And then you have all these younger Christians saying, what's wrong with you, you old fogies, you bunch of Pharisees? There's nothing wrong with this. And to my greater dismay, as I started clicking on some of the faces, finding out this guy's a pastor of this church, this guy's a pastor of that church, and that guy's a pastor of that church, you know, one of the things that was talked about in the bayonet training was here you had, we're talking about three years ago, and, and you know, of course, leading up to three years ago, these mega church pastors who had a lot of influence, who had a voice, who, who could promulgate, promulgate their message of grace, of hyper grace. And, you know, the, the, one of the prophetic warnings that Pastor Bronk had was, you know, we can be concerned about these guys. They certainly have a voice and they can get their message out there and people are, are buying into it in droves. But the real concern are, are the acolytes, are their disciples, are the young guys and young women who are coming up behind them just consuming this message and then taking it to the next level. So these hyper grace guys... I don't believe any of them would ever promote Game of Thrones. I, I don't think so. I don't know that I've ever heard them say or, or, or do anything that would in any way say that fornication was okay. They might say, well, if you do fornicate, it doesn't matter. God has already forgiven you, and every sin you'll, you'll ever commit, you're forgiven, and so on and so forth. But now we've come to the point where the, their acolytes are saying God doesn't care. I mean, really, honestly, they think that the Christ in them is watching that show with them. I don't think so. Amen. And, and this is the state of the body of Christ today in so many places. What I saw, of course, in terms of those comments was a whole lot of opinions. Lots and lots of opinions, but none of them founded on the Word of God. None of them informed and educated and shaped and founded on what God has to say. They don't know the Word of God. Their conscience is so seared that they can sit down and watch filth like that week after week after week, season after season after season. It's a big thing. I mean, I didn't really know what the show was. It was always advertised everywhere, but I'm not much into witchcraft, sci-fi stuff. I, to me, my, my conscience does not allow me to watch that stuff. You know, what's interesting is one of the things that was said was, you know, hey, listen, Romans 14, Paul said, that we're not to judge other people's freedoms. And so if you don't have the freedom to watch Game of Thrones, well, that's good. Don't watch it, but don't judge someone else who has the freedom to do it. That is not what that scripture is talking about. Yeah, listen, if I have freedom to punch you in the face, you're going to say that's okay and you can't judge me for that? Come on. God says not to punch people in the face. If, if I feel that I have the freedom to take your things without you wanting me to, what are you going to do to stop me? Romans 14, buddy, don't judge me for taking your things when you don't want me. The, 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 it's illogical. And yet their corrupted mind is unable to see the illogic reasoning that they've come to. That they could say, with their Bible on their lap, I'm okay watching Game of Thrones. Jesus is okay with this. It just doesn't make sense. The truth is they don't probably spend enough time in the Word. Because if they did spend enough time in the Word, what, what have we heard so far this week? That the Word will wash you. The Word will wash you. What it'll do is it'll provoke a reset of your seared conscience. If you spend enough time in the Word, if you've seared it and you've seared it, guess what? You keep seeing it over and over again. Hey, wait a minute. God hates this stuff. A reset's going to happen. Wow, I've got all these dead limbs. Oh, my goodness. I've got to walk away from this. Because we know the truth is, and, and I love how Gary preaches it, teaches from his own personal experience how he got born again. It didn't take very long before the, the preacher on the inside of him began to, say, began to say to him, all these things have to go. You, you can't hold on to these things anymore. They have to go. Hallelujah. So these, we see that what's happened is the error that these mega church pastors were preaching has metastasized, has become such a much greater cancer and it's spreading throughout the body of Christ. And if you think, 
a mega church pastor has influence over people, I'm going to say that the preacher, the pastor of the tens and the hundreds, the guy who led you to Christ, the guy who baptized or, or dedicated your children to the Lord, the guy who sat beside you when you mourned and wept over the loss of a loved one or whatever, and if that guy tells you or that woman tells you it's okay to watch Game of Thrones, you think maybe that has so much greater weight? This is the world we're living in. How did we get there? The thing is, no one woke up one morning. I don't believe any of these people, especially the pastors, ever woke up one morning and thought to themselves, hmm, today would be a good day to step into apostasy. I'm going to turn back on the truth. The truth is, they think they're still walking in the truth. They're absolutely deceived. And we see that there, there will be a falling away. And whenever I read scriptures like that, I always, oh, Holy Spirit, how do I prevent myself from walking that way? And how do I keep the people around me and anyone that I can speak to, how do I keep them from falling away? Because I know that the, the foolishness would be to think, that's other people. You know, none, nothing like that could ever happen to me. It could if you're not careful. It could if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? No one intentionally or purposely chooses to be an apostate. And none of the people who are in that state right now would say, I'm an apostate. They all believe they're still in right relationship with God, right? A lot of it has to do with hanging on to those dead limbs. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 talks about uh, straight is the, is the way and narrow is the gate, correct? And, and it goes on and it says, you know, very few find the narrow gate. And it's because the path is straight, meaning there's a lot of things that don't fit on the path. Amen. And we know that, you know, we start on the path and maybe it's, you know, miles wide, but as we're walking with God and the Father and He begins to prune, it's because He has to prune those things so that we can keep going down the path. Yes. The path is narrowing. These things can't go with you because these things will produce death in your life. They have to go. And the reason so many people don't find that, that narrow gate, that straight gate, is because they want to hold on to these dead limbs. They don't want to let go of them. And when the conscience begins to speak up and say, hey, wait a minute, this, this has to go. Wait a minute, my pastor said that that was just condemnation. I'm just sear that away. I don't have to hear that anymore. And they keep the limb, and the limb keeps them from walking down the path. I don't want to mourn the limbs anymore because those limbs only produce death in my life. They don't want to let go of the world. They want to hold on to the things that they want to hold on to. And if we look and search out the scriptures, we'd never, ever find a pattern of this is how you hold on to sin and walk with Jesus. That isn't in there. Hallelujah. If you turn with me to uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans, we're going to go to the first chapter. Hallelujah. All right, three hours to go. Just so you all know, Marion's will still be there when I'm done. Actually, Pastor Jim said, because I asked him, well, how long do I have, an hour and a half, two hours? He said, you can preach as long as you want. We'll just tell you how good the Marion's was when you're done. <laughs> so I already know that Pastor Jim's just going to get up and walk out on me, so. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I know, you're all with him. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> What's funny is, one person said, you know, the Holy Spirit chose you to preach on this morning because it's kind of like Christmas morning and a kid going to you know, Christmas Eve service. You know, which kid is paying attention to anything going on at church on Christmas Eve? So God had to choose someone like you to, to keep the people interested. And then someone else said, the Holy Spirit chose you because <laughs> nobody was going to pay attention anyways, and so they may as well choose you. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on, man. Oh, that's cold. That's cold. <laughs> yes, Lord, I will love that person. <laughs> that is one of the limbs producing fruit in my life. I'm loving. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's just start in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom 
we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, how many times have you read this and just skipped over the part where it says that they've received grace and apostleship to bring people into obedience to the faith? I mean, every time I've ever heard anyone talk about, and I say every time I've ever heard, could be other people have preached it and so forth, but every time I've ever heard it uh, talked about, you know, uh, leading people to Christ, it's really just talking about, uh, you know, knowing that you're a sinful person in need of a Savior, and you can't do anything to change your own situation, but hey, it's okay, Jesus came to deal with that, and he died on the sin for the propitiation of your sins, it's died he died on the cross for the propitiation of your sins, right? He took on all iniquity for you. And so he made the, the way for you to have a right relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. He built that bridge. But he didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead so that you might also have eternal life. And they describe that eternal life as something that's going to happen after we die and leave this mortal coil. No, no, that, that eternal life or that, um, yeah, that life is right now. Right? We know that. I don't have to reteach that. That's 101 stuff that we learned a long time ago. But that's where it's left. No, there's a lot more to being born again and coming into the kingdom of God, and that is to now come into right relationship with Him in that we now become willing, willing servants, if you will, submitting our will to His and doing what He's called us to do and being obedient to Him. You know, Paul is saying, you know, we've received grace and apostleship to bring people into obedience to the faith. But so many of the body of Christ, they've received salvation, but they've rejected obedience. I'll take the benefits of walking with Jesus while I continue to play in the world and do what I want to do. That's not what it's about. Right from the outset, we're called to obedience. We're called to lay down our will in favor of His will, right? Right? Faith is not limited to believing that Jesus is God and he died and he rose and so forth. Obedience to the faith is far more than just avoiding eternity in hell. Let's continue on here. We'll go to verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if by any means now at length I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. So Paul writes to them, he's saying, you know, I don't want you to not be, uh, not understand the, the, I wanted to come see you. I wanted to come spend time with you. I wanted to come teach you. And, you know, I haven't been able to do so, circumstances, situations, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. I haven't made it out there yet, but it's my desire to, that I should come to see you. But there's a purpose, and that purpose here is that I would impart some spiritual gift to you, and th that gift also has a purpose. It's that we might be established to the very end. Established to the end... You know, there are people who believe that once saved, always saved. Man, I just named the name of Jesus. That's it. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I can do whatever I want for the rest of my life. It's okay. I'm, I'm. Paul didn't believe that. And we, if we could go through the rest of his letters, it's clear he didn't believe that. In fact, of him, his own self, he says, I buffet my body. I keep it under lest I would be separated from the life that I've received, from the, the salvation that is promised. Even Paul, you know, we, we hold him up as, you know, this great and wonderful and whatever, and we should. He's great. One. Yay. But even he, right, even he looked at his own life and said, wait a minute, I'm going to keep these things under because I know if I don't, I'm going to stray from that narrow path. If it was good enough for Paul to keep his body under, then it's good enough for L.A., right? So he says, I want to come to you, and there's a purpose, because I want to make sure that you would be established to the end. And the reason he's saying this is because already, this is first century, this is, the church is just established, it's a baby church, and already people are flying off. They're going off into the world, they have seared their consciences, they don't even realize that they've abandoned Christ and they're gone. They're seeing it. Could you imagine being one of the early apostles, seeing people leaving in droves after all sorts of false doctrines? People falling into apostasy already at that point. We just, what happened? Th didn't he say that to the Galatians? I came and taught you guys. What happened between the last time I was there and now that you've gone off into all this deception? To the end, 
you may be established, that you would endure to the very end, that you would survive apostasy. That's why I want to come out to you. Continuing in verse 12, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, as, even as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the un, uh, unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Verse 16 here he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, we're going to throw that in there. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So he says of the gospel of Christ, I'm not ashamed of it, because it is the power of God unto, the, unto salvation. And that word power, many of you have probably heard the Greek word dunamis. It's the, the word from which we get dynamite. It's, it's the power. You know, it's incredible. It's, it's something that goes beyond our natural capacity to understand that we could go from death to life in an immeasurable measure of time. Just by virtue of having put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and having received Him as our Lord and Savior, boom! power we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into or translated from the authority of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son we're brought into life hallelujah and it's amazing you know that what is the gospel of christ again so many people think that the gospel of Christ is simply limited to you were a sinful creature in need of a savior. You could do nothing to, to change your own circumstance, your own situation. So Jesus stepped in, and if you receive him, your sins are forgiven, and you go from death to life. But the gospel of Christ is far more than that. In fact, even on just on Sunday morning, the foundation of this conference was everything that's in here is the key to the kingdom. So the gospel of Christ is actually the whole word. Jesus' very life, everything he said and did, or all, everything he didn't do, is the gospel of Christ. So this power isn't limited to simply, I went from being a sin creature to being a living creature, just like created in the image of God, right? It's, I, I, I'm living the way he lived. I'm doing what he did. I'm, I'm identifying with a new image which is on the, established and deposited on the inside of me, which is Christ in me. That's the gospel of Christ. Amen? The gospel of Christ is things like, you know, we've heard a lot about the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. I've never heard it said, the Sermon on the Plain, but there you go. Hallelujah. That's, you know, now it's the sermon in the coffee shop. Uh, you know, uh, what's the gospel of Christ? Love your enemy, right? Don't lust in your heart. Hallelujah. How about take up your cross daily? I don't like that gospel. <laughs> but we know that if we take up that part of the gospel, it's producing power, life in us. Hallelujah. Continuing in his word, Jesus said to uh, you know, his disciples, those who believed on him in John 8, 31, I think, you know, if you believe in me, great. But if you follow my word, if you continue on my word, then you are my disciples. Well, what are they doing? They're continuing in the Word. What is the Word doing? The Word is washing. The Word is purging. The Word is life, and it's producing life. Hallelujah. Uh, how about this part of the gospel? You know, people don't like it. I, I think, you know, we're, we're being conformed. I think a good faith declaration is we are being conformed to this truth of the gospel, which is fasting is good for us. And we like it. We like it because we see the end result, even if it's by faith. I call those things that be not as though they were. I'm going to like fasting, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The power of the gospel is, of course, the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who was without sin was made utterly, despicably filthy with sin. He was made to be iniquity for me, and I was made to be righteous. Hallelujah, that's the, the power of the gospel. It's dunamis. Supernatural, instantaneous power that takes us from death to life. Paul explains it in Ephesians when he explains the great power that God exercised on Jesus when he took him from spiritual death 
and raise them up again to spiritual life. That's the power that God exercised on Jesus, but also exercised on us when we put our faith in him. Hallelujah. The same pathway or the same transition that Jesus went through is the path that we follow, going from death to life. Hallelujah. And of course, we see that Jesus set in heavenly places above all uh, all principalities and authorities and so forth, and we're seated with him in those places. We're delivered from a nature that is given to sin. And this new nature, I think it's Nathan who says, this nature oozes. I like that. It's kind of weird, but I like it. (laughs) It oozes righteousness. I think Richard said it too. It doesn't matter who said it. It's great. I like having a nature that doesn't ooze filth. Have you ever been around people, they ooze, and you feel kind of yucky when, after being around them? How about oozing on people and they think, wow, I like that. <laughs> that was rather enjoyable. <laughs> I want some more of that slime. Because <laughs> it's not slime, isn't it? It's, it's like, um, you know, honey, no one would ever call honey slime. But if you pour honey on you, that's kind of, I don't know, it'd be sticky if it gets in your hair. I digress. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God. It's the dunamis. It's an incredible thing that by trusting in him, power. And it, it translates to the rest of our lives always. You know, uh, it was said earlier this week, you know, we're going to look back on these days when we thought it would be so hard that we would lay hands on people and they would receive healings. That's the power of the gospel of Christ. It's supposed to be instantaneous. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that it's going to start oozing out of us. We're going to walk around, you know, our shadow is going to ooze on people and they're going to get healed. Hallelujah. Paul continues, he says in verse 17, about the gospel of Christ, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We see in verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed. So we see that there are two things being revealed. The first one, of course, is the righteousness of God being revealed from faith to faith. And what is the revelation? The revelation is, I am righteous not because of what I do, but because of what he has done, right? He has made me righteous. I am righteous. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is not a faith statement. It is a declaration of my identity. Hallelujah. Even if there perhaps you might see some limbs in my life that don't belong, that are producing some unniceness, that's not my identity because my trunk, my, what do you call it? Yeah, the trunk, whatever, right? The body of the tree is righteous. Hallelujah. And my tree is tapped in and is abiding in the Father. I love that image that, uh, that Richard gave us the other night. I act righteously because it's who he has made me to be. They're not just leaves on my tree, fig leaves pretending to be righteous, while on the inside I'm dead. No, I act righteously because I am righteous. And it comes forth from that life that's within us, which means why are we patting ourselves on the back when we're righteous, like we deserve a trophy? It's just who you are. It's kind of like I would, you know, hey, you guys, look at me. I just breathed. (laughs) Are you impressed? (laughs) Woo-hoo! You can't see it right now, but I have blood just flowing through my veins. I am something. You know, earlier, uh, Nathan was saying that, you know, we're kind of like superheroes. I was like, oh, gosh. My superpower is sleeping. (laughs) I could take a nap anywhere. Hallelujah. But if we're superheroes... We're, there's no room for our ego. There's no room for us patting ourselves on the back. If you lay hands on somebody and they recover, that's just the life in you oozing out. Hallelujah. Right? Hallelujah. And I think for so long, part of why maybe God couldn't work through Alain, I won't speak about you, but he couldn't work through Alain, but it was because Alain had too many limbs that would say, hey, look what I did. And then maybe that would destroy Alain. And God cares more about me than he cares about that, right? He doesn't want me destroyed. There's no reward for doing righteousness. It's simply who we are. So there's no room for us hey, you know, saying, hey, check it out. Look what I'm doing. If I'm righteous, and this is the part of what's being revealed in the righteousness of God, the righteousness that is revealed in the gospel of God, if I'm righteous, I will also live like it. 
And that's being obedient to the faith. So that stands in stark contrast to people who say, I'm going to cohabitate with my girlfriend of 30 years and God doesn't care because it doesn't match up to the life on the inside. Amen? If I'm righteous, I'm going to live like it. And the first John series really brought that out and made it plain. If you, you, can't, you can't argue with what God said through John. I will live righteously and I'm not going to try to find ways to hold on to sin. That's the righteousness revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what's also revealed is that when I choose to do contrary to who I've been made to be, there's a problem. If I choose to live contrary to the life and the righteousness that is established in me, something's wrong. Sin is a choice. And I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, dang, now I'm accountable to that. Sin's a choice. Every time I've ever sinned, it's because I wanted to. And there never is an excuse of saying, well, I couldn't help it because of this, that, or the other thing. The life in me was greater than all those this, that, and the other things. And I always, always had the ability to say no. So at one point, you know, it was kind of like, oh, man. But on the other flip side of it was, oh, hallelujah. Because the truth is, every time you sin, you pay the consequence of it. It, it, Sin is no good. So it's great to get rid of it, right? The second thing we see revealed is verse 18, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is being revealed against those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They have the righteous nature, but they choose to suppress it in favor of unrighteousness. They have the truth. It is resident in them, in the person of Jesus Christ, And instead of living according to who Jesus is, they suppress that nature to watch the Game of Thrones. And they say, Jesus is okay with it. The Jesus you think is okay with it is not the Jesus of the Bible. You have created for yourself an idol, a God in your own image, and Paul carries on in this. You've created an idol and you've called him Jesus, but he is not Jesus. And that Jesus that you're following, you're following him straight into hell. Paul said, I, I want to come to you because I want to give you something to make sure you're established to the end. Why? Because there's a possibility that you may not be. Look around you. So many of the people around us are not, and this is the point of this message. It isn't to you know, point to other people and look at how wicked they are. There is a time you know, uh, to uh, mark them and set them apart and say, look, those people, they cause division in the doctrine. You know, let's mark them and stay away from them. There's a time for that. But this isn't what this message is about. This message is about what's going on in my life where I'm allowing dead limbs to stay on this tree, this righteous tree. Where is it where I am doing this, where I hold the truth in unrighteousness? I know better about this, that, or the... And we're not even sometimes, most of the time, I hope, we're not talking about gross immoral sin. We're not talking about things that would potentially disqualify us from being behind a pulpit. But maybe some of those things are things leading to. You know, what was the gateway drug to, uh, or the gateway show to Game of Thrones for some of these people? I don't know. But long before they got to Game of Thrones, their conscience was saying, don't watch this, this is no good for you. But they watched it anyways. Shut up, conscience, you're just condemnation. It's just television after all. And they watched something, and then, you know, their conscience was seared, and then it was the next one, just pushing the envelope just a little bit more, just a bit more, so that now they can sit in front of their television, watching the Game of Thrones, and, you know, part of what scares me is they're doing this, they have children around, the filth they allow in their household, what are they teaching their kids? Why is it that so many of the body of Christ never make it beyond first generation? Why are all our kids not in the body with us, right? And it's for so many of us. Well, for some of it, it's they have a free will. We understand that. But for many of them, it's because mommy and daddy did not live the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were not obedient to the truth. And they lived a lifestyle that taught me, hey, it doesn't matter what I do. What we're seeing is that there's a wrath being revealed against Christians. You know, we're used to hearing about wrath being poured out against the ungodly and the wicked, but God is saying here through Paul that there's a wrath of God, there's a a kindled anger 
in God, being, being, being brought against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. These are people who have the truth. It's in them. They're, at one time, at least, they were born again, and the truth was resident in them. Hallelujah. Jesus, help us. When the truth declares, love your enemy, but I hate him so much I don't want to, I'm suppressing the truth. So it's easy to point to fornication. It's easy to point to Game of Thrones, but in my day-to-day life, when the guy cuts me off and I want to do back to him, I'm suppressing the life on, on the inside of me because the truth of who Jesus is does not want to do that to him or her. <laughs> I've gotten the bad habit of calling everybody behind the wheel a ding-dong. Come on, ding-dong, the light's been green for three seconds. Let's go. <laughs> I blame FedEx. FedEx taught me to be impatient behind the wheel because we were always in a rush. For those of you who don't know, I work, work very briefly for FedEx. All right. Uh, love your enemy. Just do it. What truth do they hold in unrighteousness? The truth, that or the lie that they're holding on to is that they are righteous and that they should know that, un- that righteous people don't live that way. Right? Simply knowing the truth isn't what God has called us to. He's called us to live it. He's called it to be it. And whatever truth demands, that's what we're supposed to do. And if truth demands that I empty my wallet into the offering plate at the direction of the Holy Spirit, am I going to suppress that? Hallelujah. So again, no one gets up in the morning and decides, eh, I want to be an apostate today. I'm going to go play in the world. Not if they're really Christians. It happens over time. And the issue is, for those people, they were not established until the end. Let's continue on here in verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21 tells us what they did. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is the beginning of the end for a person going from uh, having the mind of Christ to then having a reprobate mind. This is the beginning. What happens is they did not glorify him when they knew him. How do we glorify God? The same way Jesus did. Jesus glorified God. John 5.30 says, I can do nothing on my own initiative or authority. That's the Amplified. I can do nothing on my own initiative or authority. Just as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is fair. It is just, it is righteous, it is unbiased, because I do not seek my own will, but only the will of him who sent me. That's how we glorify God. We glorify God by being like Jesus, doing what the Father sent him to do. We do what the Father sends us to do. Jesus lived his whole life being tempted by all the things that we're tempted by, but he never stepped into them, right? He glorified God by being righteous, by allowing the life that was in him to exercise authority over the flesh, Amen. putting the flesh where it belongs. Luke twenty-two forty-two. 42, right? We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, Oh, Lord, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Surrendering our will to the Father, that's glorifying Him. Jesus said in John 17, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. Every t- everything that Jesus did, day in and day out, glorified the Father. Amen? And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says that Jesus was, is the image of the invisible God. And in verse 18, it says that he is the firstborn from among many brethren, which means that we too are the image of the invisible God. And so how are we going to glorify God is by being obedient to the life and the nature that has been deposited on the inside of us and doing what it dictates to us, even when sometimes we don't understand it. So the conscience comes up and says, hey, I don't want you watching this show or I don't want you doing this thing. And maybe I'm not 
uh, I haven't come to the point of understanding certain things in the Word yet, but I'm going to be obedient to the life inside of me even though I don't understand it. Does that make sense? Or maybe God has only given me a part of the instruction that I need right now. I'm still going to be obedient to it even if I don't see the end of it. That's what He's calling us to do. That's how we glorify Him. Amen? So when it says they glorified Him not, so they knew He was God, they knew that He had uh, a righteous demand on their life, yet they glorified Him not. Who's glorified when we lie? Who's glorified when we commit fornication? Who's glorified when we steal? Who's glorified when we do any of those things? It's certainly not the Father, because there is no darkness in Him. He is light, and there is no darkness in Him at all, right? So when we allow darkness to come forth, we're not glorifying Him. But this is going even further than, you know, the occasional slip up on our part. This is people who established a lifestyle of glorifying the enemy, glorifying Satan, glorifying the flesh, instead of glorifying the Father. It is not glorifying to the Father to sit down and watch the Game of Thrones or do things like that. When we fellowship with that, those things that He abhors, those things that He finds disgusting, we are not glorifying Him. He is not glorified by the things that He is not. Amen? It says, it continues, He says, because they glorified him not, talking about uh, they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This word vain talks about foolish, wicked, idolatrous, and imaginations talks about the internal discussion that we have. This, our imaginations, we all, all have that. We pretty much, all of us, have an internal discussion going on all the time. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Is this right? Is this not right? And what, what Paul is saying is the result of them not glorifying the Father they became foolish, they became uh, wicked and idolatrous in their internal thinking. Their very thinking, their mindsets became so corrupted, they ceased to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ knows better than to watch filth on television. The mind of Christ knows better than to hate people. But when we don't glorify the Father, that's what happens. We begin to cause our inner reasoning to become foolish, wicked, and idolatrous, and our hearts become darkened. And the result of not glorifying Him, which is not living according to the image He's given us, is that they become unable to make sound and reasonable decisions. How is it that a Christian could stand up behind a pulpit and say, it's okay to kill babies. It's okay to abort babies. It's a woman's right to choose. They've become vain in their, in their reasonings. Their foolish hearts have been darkened. Hallelujah. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They essentially, they took Jesus and replaced him with another Jesus, a Jesus that was agreeable to them, a Jesus who says it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that, a Jesus who says as long as you receive my work of the cross, you can cohabitate with whoever you want for as long as you want, you can do all these things. They began to worship a Jesus who is no Jesus, a Jesus who is created in the image that they want. Amen? How did they get there? Nobody, I mean, nobody sets out to go to hell. Nobody who, who's, who's not damaged in their brain in some way. Nobody wants to go to hell if they understand what hell is, right? If we were to continue verse 26 to 32, it just explains and reveals the, the, the descent into total corruption so that they eventually are no longer recognizable as the new creature that God has made us to be, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. No longer recognizable. So much corruption that verse 32 says... These people who, in their natural intellect, they know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. But they're so corrupted in their spiritual mind that they not only 
do the same things, but they take pleasure. They celebrate the people who do it too. Look at you, you're so free walking in that grace that God has given you. You're so free that you can live in sin. Yeah, hallelujah, you're so free, you can't sin enough to separate you from the grace of God. It's a deception and it's a lie. Are they doomed? The people who have gone this far, the guy, the pastor who vehemently defends Game of Thrones on Facebook, is he doomed to hell? I don't think he is until he steps into eternity. I think there's still a buying back, and I think that's the significance of the Word of God in terms of Ephesians chapter 5, 26, that it washes us and it cleanses us like water. If these guys go and spend time in the Word and, and truthfully, you know, uh, um, meekly, with humility, allow the Word of God to do what is, it is designed to do, it can pull them out. I want you to turn, or just look at me here, with me here, because the Word is the cure. Can a seared conscience be made tender again? Yes. The Word will do that. Romans 1.28 says about these people, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, those things that are not proper, those things that are not right, those things that are sin. So we, we, we see here, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. This is not God saying, I'm making you a reprobate. God is saying, if that's what you want, you have a free will, I'm going to let you run into this. I, I've put everything in your path to keep you from going there, but you have stubbornly and steadfastly persisted in going there. I've done all that I can. I'm, 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 I'm letting you go. But he says here about them that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and that's the key. See, this is the key for us. This is the key that Paul was talking about in verse 11 when he said, I want to bring you something that to the end you may be established. The key here is retaining God in our knowledge. So this word knowledge in the Greek is epinosis. Now you might know the word gnosis, which is the word for knowledge. You know, that's the amazing thing about the Greek language is that we, they have so many more words and we end up translating them knowledge, 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 knowledge. So knowledge in terms of gnosis is a general or imprecise knowledge. I know certain things. And it could be things as, as an example of, I know I parked my car in the parking lot at the mall. But epinosis is an informed knowledge. I know that I parked a car in lot D, row 3, by the lamppost. Okay, so there's a difference between just knowledge and epinosis, which is an informed, purposeful knowledge. As I was leaving the car, I purposed to see and know this is where I'm leaving it. Okay, does that make sense so far? It's a very simple explanation. Epinosis requires a thorough and purposeful participation with the object of knowledge. This is what the Christian must do. The Christian must purposefully, intentionally participate with the Word of God. I'm going to take this, I'm going to fellowship with this, I'm going to bring this and make this a part of me, I'm going to allow this in here to inform what I believe, what I think, what I know. See, the thing is, we do have experiences, don't we? You know, uh, I pray for someone, and they didn't get healed. So that experience tells me that God wants them to stay sick. Well, wait a minute. The Word of God, when I epignosis it, informs me and tells me, no, that's not the case. That this experience, I, I misunderstood. I drew the wrong conclusion from the outcome of that experience. The truth is, God's will is that all should be healed. And in fact, when I see the Word, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, in operation, in the Gospels, in, in the four Gospels, I see that He healed them all. And there was never, ever an occasion when He turned anybody away, ever. He healed them all. And He never at any point said, I would heal you, but because I'm attentive to the words of the Father, He said not to heal you, that... There's a purpose in you being sick, so I'm not going to heal you. That, that's not there. It's not in the Word. And I know that. Why? Because I have purpose to spend time in the Word. And so what Paul is saying here is, how is it that they came to a point in verse 18 that they, uh, there's a wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. The truth is in them, okay? They, 
they have received the image of God. It is, it is the life that is within them. But how is it that they were able to hold it in unrighteousness? Because a lot of times they think they're doing righteously when they're not. And the, th- the reason they think they're doing righteously is because they didn't epignosis the word of God. They didn't spend time in the word of God to know that that's not true. It's why they can say, wait a minute, Romans 14 says that you can't judge me for the things that I have freedom to do. That's not true. Go and epignosis Romans 14. In fact, do the whole book, the whole letter, to get the context and, un- and the understanding of what God is trying to say. The reason they were given over to a reprobate mind is because they did not see fit to make this a major part of their lives. We need the Word of God. We need it. It's the washing. It cleanses us. Hallelujah. It removes all that false doctrine. It removes the nonsense. It removes the lies because it's truth. Hallelujah. You know, the sad thing is so many people don't even believe it's the truth anymore. They're in a bad way. In the context of Romans 1, these people did not purposefully engage the Word of God. They did not intentionally interact with the Word of God. They did not allow the Word of God to influence and change them. They did not allow the Word of God to wash them. Amen? Epinosis, a purposeful, intentional interaction with the Word of God, is a knowledge that enables a person to avoid error and false doctrine. Hallelujah. Failure to retain God in their knowledge, in their epignosis, leads to a reprobate mind. Reprobate mind, of course, uh, adikomos. That is the word in the Greek, and it means unapproved, unworthy, something that has been tested or assayed, and the value has been determined as being negative. It is something that is undiscerning, undistinguishing. This is what we see. They're undistinguishing. When they sit down in front of filth and they can't distinguish that it's filth, That's a reprobate mind. Don't say you're a a Christian. Don't say that you are a disciplined follower of Christ. If you will be my disciples, you will follow in my what? My word. Hallelujah. The Greek adjective adikomos describes something that is rejected, disqualified, and has failed a test. In the classical Greek, this word describes something that is proven to be false, worthless, useless after it has been tested. Having a mind and thought process that is lacking in the knowledge of God and incapable of critically determining right from wrong. And that's what we're seeing. They can't, they can't determine right from wrong. But here's the cure. This is the cure right here. Yes, we, we definitely need to pray in the Spirit. Yes, we definitely need to worship. But right now, we know that a lot of their worship is just soulish. It's just emotion. They're not even touching the heart of God because they're not even worshiping Jesus. The Jesus they worship is a false creation an image that they created for themselves oh jesus you forgave me of all my wickedness hallelujah and i'm going to go back to living with my whatever when you go to a church okay so people say i want to show love to sinners that's good we want to show love to sinners and we don't want to kill sinners we want to bring them into the kingdom But a sinner who comes to church week after week after week, one of two things is going to happen if they're in a proper church. Either they're going to repent of their sin and they are going to turn their lives around and they're going to stop living that sin or they're going to leave. That's it. They're not going to stay in the church and say, well, we're here because we want to affect change in the church and we want to be a part of what the church is becoming, which is a church free to whatever. If that's the kind of church you're in, (laughs) leave. Run, don't walk, run out of that kind of church because you're subjected, you're subjecting yourself to poison week in and week out. Amen? What we see in Romans chapter 1 perfectly describes the mindset of the Facebook Christian who thinks it's okay to use profanity on Facebook, you know, swearing like a sailor. I can say that because I used to be one. And believe me, sailors swear. My goodness. In all languages. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, in the French contingent of sailors, and there, there, there are no slouches when it comes to swearing. Anyways, a uh, Facebook Christian who can post dirty jokes and whatever, man, they're, they're perfectly describing the mindset. 
because their conscience should convict them. We don't have time. We're going to close here in a moment. I can hear your stomach saying, shut up, I want Marion's. The people that I read, their, their, their responses to the question, are, are Christians really watching this and is this okay? The teacher knew it wasn't. He was trying to start a debate and he did. He really did start a debate. Uh, again, I question the wisdom of that because it's not wise. It certainly puts us on display for the world. Look, these guys can't even agree with each other. But it certainly shows the state of the church and the body of Christ today by and large. You know, God has reserved unto himself a remnant. Let's make sure we're in that remnant. We have to intentionally and purposefully assimilate, fellowship with, commune with the word of God, and allow it to have its work in us. God wants to prune the branches that don't bear fruit, and we have to let him do it. His word is going to show those fruit, those branches. And then when we let him do it... <laughs> Hey, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to mourn the loss of this. I'm going to rejoice in this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you. You guys can stand with me if you wish. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you that, Lord, we're described here as the tip of the spear, and I thank you for that, Lord. I, I, I identify with that. I want to receive that. Well, we're the, the group of people who have said, and not to boast or to pat ourselves on the back, there's no trophies for us. We're just doing, who we, doing according to who we've been made to be. Hallelujah. We're allowing your life to flow and ooze out of us. But Lord, I thank you for your word continuing to refine us, continuing to show us those branches and those twigs that need to be pruned off. I thank you, Lord, that there is an establishing happening in us that we will be established until the very end. I thank you for it, Lord. Lord, you know those areas of our seared conscience that need to be reset, that need to be provoked to tenderness again. So, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would lead us to those passages in the Word, those areas in the Word, that will do that in those areas. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you never leave us, Lord, that we're not orphans, that you're with us every step of the way. And that indeed, as we come against those provoking passages in the Word of God that push against those seared areas, Lord, you're with us in those moments and you walk us through it. And Lord, we come out on the other side of that, a few limbs short, but bearing more fruit and glorifying the Father. Hallelujah. Lord, that is, I know it's the heart cry of the people in this room. Lord, that we would be able to say at the end of our days, I have done all that you've told me to do, and I have glorified you in the earth. Hallelujah. We love you, Father. Amen. 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 Praise God. You know, it's interesting how that these sermons, um, we may be here in this room watching and thinking, you know, yeah, well, praise God, you know, man, I like that. It's uplifting, encouraging, and, you know, but, you know, thank God it really doesn't apply to me. But, you know, there are a lot of Christians who at one time would have sat and listened and said, that's not me. I'm not doing that stuff. But now these messages are going forth because so many of those Christians are now doing those things. And it's almost like God is firing the warning shot over the bow of our lives saying, if you don't guard your heart and your life, you will be there. You're going to be there. So we need to take these things to heart. Praise God. And now we're going to go and take some pizza to our stomach. Glory to God. Um, if you don't know how to get to Marion's, just follow people. Because... You know, the train's going to be taken off here pretty soon. But uh, we'll see you over there at Marion's. And again, don't worry about the money. Just come and fellowship. And you say, well, I'm fasting. You say, well, you need to get over it for at least one meal. Glory to God. <laughs> if you don't want to eat, don't. Just come and fellowship. That's okay. All right. We'll see you at Marion's.